Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week, we have a look at the 1972 film Death Master, directed by Ray Danton. This is episode 396. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So warning, spoilers ahead from Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, publisher at Castle Bridge Media, home of the Castle of Horror Anthology. With me from Austin is Tony Sabaccio, lead singer and bassist of the band Deserts and Mars, and lead guitarist of the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin, Mr. Drew Edwards is the writer-creator of the long-running underground comic Halloween Man, which you can find at Global Comics. He is a Best Writer Ringo nominee, Austin Chronicle, Best of Austin Award winner, and a member of the Penn America Fellowship. Say hello, Drew. I just want to go to town to have some steak and whiskey. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so good. Oh, that guy. Uh, And finally, also in Denver, big fan of this movie, I think. I, I mean, <laughs> color commentary from Julia Guzman of Guzman Immigration of Denver. Say hello, Julia. Hello, Julia. I have no idea why I said that because you weren't, you didn't particularly not like this movie. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I don't know. I'm actually giddy with just, just pure joy about talking about this movie. So, so the, uh, and it's okay if you guys do not like it because this is one of those movies that I, I feel I feel Teflon. I feel like my love for this movie cannot be tainted by um, by logic. So, all right. Uh, Deathmaster. Deathmaster is a strange creature. It is a sort of sequel. I'm calling it that. I don't care what it actually is. It is a sort of sequel to Count Yorga and Return of Count Yorga, starring the star of those movies, Robert Corey, ex- except this time Corey plays Corda, a mysterious vampire who appears in Southern California as a cult leader, a guru to a bunch of local young people. Uh, and it seems like this movie was actually filmed between the original Count Yorga and Return of Count Yorga. Uh, so, so it's got a very, very strange history, and we're going to do our best at that. So, all right. Let's get our opening thoughts, and then we'll get into it. We'll go Julia, Tony, Drew, and then I'll go, um, because we haven't started with Julia in a couple weeks. Julia, (laughs) what are your opening thoughts? Why do you laugh? My opening thought is that I psychically intuited that you were going to start with me, and then then you were going to say, because we haven't started with Julia in a while. That's I was true. like, okay, here we go. There's a certain uh, predictability, yes. and I'm sorry. Okay, uh-huh. but uh, <laughs> but but what did you think of Deathmaster? Um, I was amused by it. If I definitely found it amusing. <laughs> I think it's the best way to put it. Um, I like the whole kind of Manson family vibe of the hippies. I think it's an interesting idea to have um, a vampire that you know becomes the guru. I think it was called guru vampire when it was when they were shooting it it was like their shooting title um but yeah the vampire is a, is the, the person that they're all like oh you know we want to be part of your cult dude and uh and, you know and they have this amazing setting that i'm not exactly sure how it is that they managed to find and be in this place but it's a gorgeous like castle yeah. um so all of that was pretty clever and um just kind of an interesting twist on on the whole vampire thing. Um, I like, I like the guru. I like the Robert Corey character. Um, I think he's, he's, you know, groovy. And uh, <laughs> I like his, uh, his really cool, um, you know, kind of guru coat that he wears. Um, you know, but that's not, I mean, it's pretty dumb. There's a lot of dumb stuff in it. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't know. I think that's about, I, I like the clothing too. I thought that clothing, all of the clothing was cool. So Excellent. there were things I liked and, but I did think it was kind of dumb. All right. All right. Uh, Tony, what are your thoughts? Death Master, Death Master, bring me a vamp. Um, I, I also thought of this as the as some kind of weird inception of Jared Leto's. Like he's been Morbius, and he's also <laughs> been a cult leader. So, is, are we living in a simulation? And this things yep. just keep coming about. I don't know. Um, it's it's kind of an interesting movie. It's weird that it's so hard to find. Yeah, and it also the score and the vibe feels really like a TV movie. And again, I don't mean that as a bad thing. It just struck me as the way the score is done and the pacing yeah. and how it's cut. Uh, I mean, I don't remember any fades to black, but like it has that vibe. And I was surprised that it wasn't. Um, and again, that's not a bad thing. It just reminded me of that. Um, I'm still curious. Like I, I wonder how many actual hippies were like, 
Oh, why are we portrayed? No this hippies way? were or, hurt during the making of this. But were they portrayed? Like, are they mad, or is that if if this was a time capsule of hippie dumb, the most annoying people ever? Just I can't yeah. I can't stand them in this movie. I just. <laughs> The bikers aren't much better, but I cannot. Oh, man, I just. And this is from somebody who gets accused of being too nice or maybe being hippy dippy <laughs> about things. But I, oof, there's something about true hippie dumb, yes. especially in media, right? Yeah. Because in the same way that beatniks are portrayed, like there's a bunch of beatniks who are like, come on, man, really? But that over the top or punks, right? <laughs> like, right. All punks, like Quincy punks. Right, our real punks like. Thank you. I have to grief, flag on the man. play. I just have to mention that that what you're referring to with Quincy punks is there was an episode of Quincy where Quincy, for reasons that remain mysterious to me, discovers punk rock and thinks right. it's too dangerous. Right. And, and or or Moloch and chips, right? With like yes. his pseudo kiss. All the, all those movements in media are often overblown. Yes, but if ah, oh, insufferable, insufferable in this movie. But uh, you know, they get controlled by a vampire, and that's kind of interesting. So. Uh, but it, it's as a as a movie, it's really interesting. You know, it's got a kung fu hippie. That's interesting. <laughs> like, it's yes. got hippies and bikers, kind of. Mixing it up, I don't know. It's entertaining. Uh, it's a it's an interesting piece as kind of a side yoga thing, which I think is fascinating. Um, but yeah, I don't regret seeing it. But boy, there were parts where I was just spare me insufferable hippies. I think I, I I don't know for some reason that trope and that attitude. And I don't know if it's because I deal with flaky musicians a lot or what, but. <laughs> And I gotta say, I bet that that mansion just reeks. That many hippies at that time period. Sorry. And again, like I try to be a nice person, and like I shouldn't. I shouldn't probably say I shouldn't. I shouldn't be the one making kind of no, no. Dirty, dirty hippie references. But boy, when you see it, you're just like. At least I bet it smelled like patchouli, something fierce. I was gonna say there's probably a fair <laughs> amount of incense. But let, hold That's that thought I'm because anyway. I want to get I want to get back to the hippie stuff. Yeah. Um. But let's see what Drew has to say. Drew, uh, are you coming down more or less where Tony is, or are you anywhere else? So, like Julia, I was amused. Um. Yeah. I feel like that where I would put the hippies in this is more along the like they very much remind me of the hippies that they would occasionally have on um get smart whenever right. the, the groovy right. guru was the was the villain of the week yeah um the, you know like these are these are like very super stereotypical probably a what a what a middle-aged person <laughs> idea right. of what a hippie was like because i'm i'm assuming that like the person that that wrote this was not actually from you know any of the subcultures portrayed here um robert he might have been, been a vampire he might have oh, been a vampire. There you, go. <laughs> he um, been. Uh, you know robert quarry is is great in this like i i I don't know if I 100% buy that a group of young people would listen to him, but mm -hmm. um, he, as much as this is like Yorga adjacent, I do think he does a pretty good job of making this guy seem well, different in its way from Yorga, which I thought is pretty cool. Um, my my other takeaway though, and I've said this a several times when we we've, we've been sort of talking about the movie the last several days. Yeah, I wish I think this movie is pretty entertaining as it is. I think it would be one hundred percent better if the like sh main character hero, wh whatever you want to call him, if the main hippie that ends up being the hero was not and the like brutish knucklehead biker dude that is just yeah cynical like oh. i think if you had replaced those two like swapped out those two characters this movie would have become so much more entertaining because like the whole reason why the guy is the hero by default is because he just thinks that he thinks that all the hippie you know the hippie stuff is is bull bull crap and he's just there to eat eat meat score with chicks and and yeah. party can you imagine if the if instead what we got was a movie where he you know befriends the one guy kung, our kung fu hippie yes and 
And then when things go bad, he enlists all the bikers. So that's like the end of Return of the Living. I mean, right? uh, Night, Night oh, of the Living. That's Dead. a wonderful you know, idea. Day yeah. of the day. Yeah. Day of the day. Dawn of the yeah. day. Can you, Dawn of the, why am I? I know this. I don't know why my brain is. <laughs> but, but you're, every zombie movie except that because my brain is dumb tonight. No, no, no. So, yes, of course. I, I'm, I'm Dawn of the you. Dead, of course. I, that would have been one of my all time yeah. favorite movies. But can you imagine how crazy that would have been? Well, because, like, yeah, I mean, like, you're right. The, the movie opens and you have bikers versus hippies, but then the bikers just go away. And it's right. just the one biker. Well, left. except for the one, and he well, doesn't survive. The one survive, who becomes friends right. with them. No, he's he like, should... he's like, they're like bikers versus hippies. The, bi- the main biker and main hippie guy get into a fight because the our, our hero yeah, hippie because is bikers like, versus hippies, which is the, the yeah, thing of the time, our, right? Like, hero, right? Right, and because they are hassling hippie, the, the... Our hero hippie wants to defend the jewelry sales guy that, you know, huh. um, pop. John Fiedler. And so yeah. he's like, leave him alone. So they get into a fight. And then when the, when the what does she call it? The heat shows up, the cops. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, on that, they that, run that's off that's and suddenly they're BFFs. They're like, hey, let's go have dinner together. Yeah, because everybody, again, this is the 70s. <laughs> so when the fuzz shows up, everybody's on, like, all the countercultures. The fuzz is there yeah. to break your good time and sure. everything else and to take <laughs> you away. I don't know how we've gotten to where we are now. But <laughs> can I, counterculture can... movies of the time. When the fuzz shows up, they're like, we got to get out of it. We got to, you know, yes. beat, beat. And that's part of, that's how they bond is like, well, <laughs> we both don't want the law coming out to us. So. <laughs> and, and mind you, right before that scene, you've got Bill Ewing, who plays Pico, who's our, our young point of view character, young hero. He does some like Kung Fu, basically. It's more like jujitsu kind of. So, I mean, I'm sure somebody, you know, mar- with martial arts training. And, and he wears really, it, hippie clothes. And he hippie beads, yeah, and he, 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 he wears and he, he wears his hair in an American in a in a sort of American Indian style with a with a a head band. I mean, he is everything. Here's my take on all of this. Like like, what, why is the what, why is the biker guy not the point of view character? And the answer is because this movie isn't really for hippies and it's not really for bikers. This movie is for more or less the straights in right. like most of america who have gone to the drive-in and they see this movie and they don't really they're not hippies per se but they know they get the idea and they get the idea that hippies are a little more close to home than than scary bikers and so you you have so that's the gradation right (laughs) by the way in all fairness to real hippies out there I've sat through more than my share of metalhead boneheaded metalheads in movies so Fist, fist bump to anybody who looks at this and goes, "Yeah, I, I find those people to be insufferable as well." Well, also remember, I, you know, I've sat through many, many movies of like, "Oh, look, it's the metalhead. Here we go." Oh. Yeah. In the <laughs> in the world in the world of pop culture, again, of just like like my my grandparents or my parents in like Texas, right? You know, the, then you, you've got this gradations of countercultures and. The hippies are the people who went to Woodstock and basically just had a good time and got laid and 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 smoked weed and, and that was okay. And the bikers, remember Altamont happened in 69 and that went to shit because of the Hells Angels. And so there's this popular, this is a popular reading of all of this, okay? I'm sure. not talking about the actual Altamont whatever the hell actually happened at Altamont. This is the way people read it. So when you get to something like this, you definitely, it's like, those guys are scary. That guy, you know, Bill Ewing as Pico, he's just some kid from my neighborhood who like has decided that this is a way to score chicks and, and, you know, and And be far out, man. And be far out. And, and and I'm like, Roger Ebert reviewed this movie in 1972. And, (laughs) And he said it's a wonderful review, so I don't want to steal his his jokes, um, you know. So you should you should read it. But one of the things that he said that I thought was wonderful was that all of the hippies in this movie talk like like they've never said these words before in their lives. He, he said it, it's like if you tried to right. cast Frankie Avalon as a hippie and told him to say a lot of stuff like, and this is an actual quote from this movie: uh, "Don't split, man. We groove on what you say." When when right when he shows up. I uh my... <laughs> it's like it's like the uh the meme, you know, what's up, young kid? Yeah. Yes, what's up, fellow kids? Yeah, hello, hello young people. <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> my Steven, Ruby, Steven, hippie. Steve Buscemi. Yeah, Steve Buscemi. Yeah. But this is a my, you know let us honestly, all grew, can we? Yeah. <laughs> this is a Jason movie. 
right? There are certain ones that, that you can just see like are on a canister that says, well, Jason will like this. And, and anything where like, like this, and we watched the one with Frankie Avalon, uh, you know, Horror House, which was very similar. Anything where they're trying to present the culture of the 60s to capture it on film, I am all over that. Just I, I just love it. I watch it with wide eyes through the whole thing, um, and and I always will. I'm also fascinated by anything from this era of like 1972 because you can't escape. In the same way that in the late 70s and the 80s, you couldn't escape Vietnam. Vietnam hasn't ended in 1972. It won't end until 1975. So that long national nightmare is only being thought of in terms of the peace movement at this point. Mm -hmm. So Vietnam is not really deeply imprinted here, except for the importance of the hippies. But Manson, Manson is like a deep hoof, a deep hoof print on this movie, you know, because the Tate LaBianca murders happened in 1969. So, th so that's just like yesterday, right? I mean, that's as recent as the, as, as the, uh, the Will Smith slap, you know, and, and, and so there uh, it is, it's on people's mind. And so after they made Count Yorga, now you've got some people who said, hey, how about if we took Count Yorga and we did a very similar movie, but instead of him uh, moving in, and, and this is us getting started, um, instead of Count Yorga moving into middle class Los Angeles and dealing with doctors and lawyers, how about if instead Count Yorga um, is Manson? any any like uh, he swoops in uh and he brings hippies under his wing and, and i sort of like this concept that that this vampire sort of reinvents himself i in my in my head canon this is count yorga it's just literally the same vampire i i, 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 I kim I newman know. agrees with you oh like, yeah he he in <laughs> in the anno in the anno dracula series he he has count yorga as a re reoccurring lieutenant of, ah. of dracula and in the one of the novels that that is set takes place in california they yeah. run across this cult and of course it's just count yorga in in hippie drag and um i i you and i i jokey if that's the case yeah i i get the impulse of that and i do think because the vampire just sort of shows up like there's yeah. never really like the the one hippie kind of summons him from the sea um yeah. i do think that it might work better if this was a sequel but um i will say that the character like count yorga is very much a classic movie vampire in the vein of bella lugosi and christopher lee right. like he is that kind of vampire the vampire that's in this is fair. Like I said, credit to Robert Quarry. Like it's a fairly distinct character. It doesn't just feel like they put a new coat of paint on Count mm. Yorga. Like I, I, I was expecting him to be more Count Yorga like mm. because of everything I had ever heard about this movie. And you know, I, I. <laughs> I, you know, he's not that like he's, he's, you're, you're very much correct. Like he is the specter of the Manson killings. And... Yeah. yeah. But with way more just guru Go clap trap. Yes. Oh, and he's like totally, his, it's his totally guru goofy. clap trap drives me nuts too. But I mean, that's what he's well, supposed but, to but do. But interestingly do enough, so. Corey, uh, uh, a lot of, so so Cor we should talk about this first and then and then we'll get back to working through the plot because I want to talk about him washing up in the ocean. But talking about Corey first as this vampire, I don't remember. We did Yorga probably in like our first year of doing the show. So it's been a no, while. No, no, no. It was way It was late. You don't yeah, think so? Sure. Well, yeah, anyway, it was a long time ago, though. It has. It, I, I swear to you, it's been years since. since yeah. It's been I mean, years. It's kind of fabulous it's... now, but it, it was it was sooner. It was more recent than you think. I believe. Okay. All right. Fair. What I do remember is that Count Yorga was a Hugh Hefner Bell Lugosi. I mean, he wore that smoking jacket and all that stuff. Um, yeah, but he was way more violent, man. He would. Oh yeah. He would mess people. people up and choke people at, at the, the at get a win. run and choke. Yeah, Count? exactly. Yes. <laughs> right. The run like, and this choke guy is not that. That's where I'm kind of like, I get it, but also like this smooth guru yeah. guy. Is he not does have the same choke. 
guy. He does have the same teeth. He literally has the same sure. teeth that and he those wore. Right. Teeth the... are so scary. Yeah. They are so scary. But they were yeah. made for him by a dentist for Yorga, and he's just like, I'm keeping these. And no wonder. And his teeth look so different and so much better than everybody else. Everybody else looks like they got those plastic teeth that you get at the store right. on at the Halloween. Line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the so a lot of one thing that he does in Yorga and in this movie uh at where he's called Corda but again there's no you know if you're going to headcanon it's Yorga he could lie man this this, guy, this sure. is not a very nice sure. person but he has all these monologues where he's where he talks about immortality and and the well, meaning apparently of, he he know. like um improvised those right yeah yeah apparently Robert Quarry basically improvised a lot of these a lot of these um sort of vampire Spiritual. philosophy yeah. <laughs> things that makes sense like yeah. Because there's a certain stream of consciousness yes. vibe to a lot of the things that he's saying. Yeah. Um, you it's know, so like wild. Yeah. Yeah. I, I not saying that you can't squint and make him Yorga. Yeah. Like I, like I, I, I don't dis. And far be it for me to disagree with you or Kim Newman. Jason. No, no, no. But, uh, I, but yeah. I'm just saying as. as Act acting wise, I do think Robert Quarry does a very good job of of even though he's playing uh a, a you know a vampire in a contemporary setting yet again, like yes. he does a very good job of differentiating the two characters. Like he That's doesn't he doesn't yeah. look like Count Yorga. Like Count Yorga was was very much like that sort of suave um, you know, older gentleman you know like and you know, yeah he had the smoking jacket and he had a cape and you know yeah. it was all very like upper crust and you know this this guy you know he sort of floats around through the whole movie you know well like i mean he's... it's like i say the the even if we even if we ignored completely whether it was the same character or not in this universe, the way vampires seem to operate is that they become sort of what this community really wants to see. So, so like here in Topanga Canyon, he has decided he's going to amass himself a bunch of hippies. And so what does he appear as? He appears as a long haired guru who says he's going to show them new ways to eat and new ways to learn and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they all want to turn on. Right. So he's he's there to do that. And um, it I it, that's just fascinating to me. I mean, that's a fascinating concept of a vampire, like that a vampire will morph itself to I, just lodge itself into wherever you are. I would love to see an episode of what we do in the shadows where Matt Berry it is a flashback <laughs> and Matt Berry is this. Oh, my God. Laszlo yes. as that this would be, would be so amazing. Good. <laughs> Oh, Matt, he'd be Matt Berry would be so perfect with the long well, beard. I honestly, the, think you can re, I honestly think you could remake this movie fairly well. Um, yeah. You know, like make it maybe yeah. make some of the changes that we have kicked around here. And, you know, like where uh, this movie's, I think you could have, this movie could have gone from being kind of funny and kitschy to being something like a little better if you just tweaked a few things here yeah. and there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, I, you know, and again, it's dis. I, I will go back to and apologize that it's disingenuous to wish to, to go, well, if I were doing the movie, it would be so much better, blah, right? Like, I, we, we are here to talk about the movie as it is. And so we can, you know, it's, it's cool to talk about our wishes, but like, I think there, you know, there's a lot. I think you're right that there's a kernel of a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. For me, maybe it didn't all gel, but, you know, even down to the kind of nihilistic ending that we, we'll get to kind of. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that maybe just didn't quite come together, but uh, it's still entertaining. So I'm well, with you. There's here. also a problem if you're watching this movie, and it may be in a drive-in where you're just sort of captured. It would be let, but it's difficult to watch this movie, you know, on YouTube. By the way, which is the only way you can get it, unless unless you find the Retro Media um, uh, DVD, which uh, is I think maybe out of print, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know it can be difficult to sit through because it does have some drag. It, it kind of gets a little repetitive in the second half, mm -hmm. but 
I want to go back to the beginning. What's interesting here is we watched a movie called Lips of Blood, and and that movie ended with the vampire and the vampire's lover getting into a coffin, and the surf takes them away. And this is a movie where the surf brings the vampire to the shore. And I just found it fascinating, a weird coincidence that there are two movies where the vampire is moving from place to place with the tide, you know, in a, in a, in a wooden coffin. It's a strange concept. And it was strange to see it like pop up twice. Um, but yeah. how, how cool would it be to leave a beach party where you hop in a coffin and just get carried out to sea? <laughs> Bye everybody. And then you just get in your coffin and it floats out. Well, the hilarious thing is you would have to get in your coffin and then wait for the tide to come in. Well, no, no, float, yeah, as so, it, like the so. idea of being at night, hopefully the tide's <laughs> could, like be somewhere. But I think that would be the best exit to a party. Yes. No, it really is. Hi, it, everybody. Really, really. I'm hopping in my coffin. And... <laughs> Certainly well, memorable. Mean, <laughs> certainly remember memorable the Jaws life. begins with the girl going skinny dipping and she gets bitten yeah. by a shark. It just yeah. occurs to me that she could have run into Yorga's coffin. Like, oh, like man, this. That would... <laughs> see, that's it. I want to see that movie too. I, I don't want to talk too much about movies. I would like this to be, but that no, no, I would, no, but I would, that'd be awesome. Yeah, a surfer dude who is not a hippie and not a biker, a surfer, finds the coffin and uh, opens it up and checks it out, and then. Then our our Renfield character, who will stay for the rest of the film, Barbado, a very tall yeah. dude called Barbado, chokes the surfer to death. Straight up, and... yes. I mean, this and, is and let great, me say, let me say, what I love. One thing I love about this movie is that Barbado and Count Yorga both have their own music that they come in yeah. with. So every time Barbado enters a room or enters this shot, he has these uh, shell chimes that play. And yeah. then, and then every time um, the guru enters, he's got uh, the sit, a sitar sitar music playing, which is yes. really really cool. Oh man, I but like yes, he chokes the like to death. Rude. This familiar though, he is a TCB. I mean, not yes. so not so great about not leaving a trail from the dead surfer because he just drags. That's the a good point. <laughs> like, where did he get? Well, here's the part where he drug something. Like, there's the obvious, but boy, like. He is. That's awesome. <laughs> he just comes in. No, I'll be taking that coffin surfer guy. And then, well, and then, he like, he's always like that. He's always very silent and creepy. And yet, for some reason, um, what's his name? P- uh, what's the hippie, the, the hippie hero's name? Um, uh, it's Pico. 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 For some yeah. reason, Pico at one point is like, what's wrong with you, man? Why aren't you talking? I'm like, he's never talked. He's always looked right. exactly like this. Why are you well, thinking he's Because be obviously at one point he, like, we have to assume that prior to, prior to the movie starting that he was more normal oh, oh i never think he thought was about part that. of their world already? i never yeah. thought about that uh, right. i think he was okay. part of their i i took it as that he was part of their friend group and oh huh. I, didn't, um, I didn't think that yeah, at all i thought he was that's just like oh i need to show up because the master's coming home and it, yeah yeah that's an interesting but uh, but drew's I, 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 an interesting one the, i hmm. don't think that he worked for the vampire prior to the start of this movie i hmm. i think that well, he, he is the familiar i think he was a hippie that was into the occult oh. and you know he was gonna summon you know a vampire and you know he summoned him from the sea i think we're thinking cool. about this i think we're Backwards. more thinking about this than the screenwriters probably yeah, did, right? <laughs> um that's that's very I, yeah, I will say this about this character, and this is me, you know, kind of coming at this with a 20th century or 21st century lens, the way, yeah. you know, we often do with these things. I do find myself a little troubled that the, the Renfield character is a mute, subservient person of color. Of color. Like, I, yeah, I mean, I, it, 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 fair. it, doesn't quite play as campy fun as some of the other stuff in the 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 movie and again i i i know that you know this look this was the 70s you know cultural sensitivities were different than what they are so i'm not you know judging the movie too harshly but like you know it is something i, I thought about while watching it 
Yeah. I I get I totally get where you're coming from, and I also think they were thinking like, well, what if it's kind of voodoo-y, right? Yeah, right. and that's totally really where they were heading with it. But whether that's a good idea or not is totally different. But he is in a but regardless, he is imposing as hell. And oh yeah, it's yeah. all about doing vampire dirty deeds. Yes, uh, and he which plays is, a mean loot. He yes. does. He does. Yeah. Um, I have to say, um, just on the music thing real quick before you go off no, uh, to a different topic, Jason. So when we meet when the hippies are at the castle and they're just like sitting around and the one guy is playing the guitar, you know, he's playing mm-hmm. that Scarborough Farish song. Apparently that song is actually written it's it's called The Man Without a Vision. It's actually written by Ray Conniff. Yeah. And it's the lyrics are are partly written by um the bo- uh, Bob, what's his name? Bobby, Bobby Pickett. Bobby Pickett. Well, Bobby Pickett. It, gets, it gets better. Bobby yeah. Pickett is the dude playing the guitar. That's yes. the crazy thing is is Boris Pickett. Th- this First of all, I, I know zero things, nothing about Boris Pickett. I interrupted your flow, though. Uh, no, that's because... right. Bobby Pickett. Yeah, so Bobby Pickett is in the movie. He's I guess he's the guy playing the guitar, like you say. And then you said that he wrote or he sang Monster Mash. That's right. He right. co-wrote it. And he was 24 years old when he did that, which also blows my mind. You know, there's yeah. nothing about, about Bobby Boris Pickett and the way he sang that doing a, a Boris Karloff impression that made me think this was a 24-year-old. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> So it's it's so that's so weird. But actually, that's another interesting thing is there are some great names in this movie. I mean, because, you know, you mentioned Ray Conniff, who was this very, very popular band leader and composer. He did a lot of movies. He did. He wrote a lot of pop orchestrations. He did a lot of TV music. I mean, this was a this was as recognizable a composer, you know, short of like Mancini as you could get in in the mid century and so he's working on this movie uh that guy who plays pop John John, John Fiedler John, who's John from Fiedler. from from uh from Bob the Bob Newhart show is where I knew him from Bob Newhart show he's the voice of Piglet he's uh um the, I remember him from Harper Valley PTA <laughs> anyway these are like recognizable people yeah sort of on the periphery of this weird little film that is not available anywhere. That, I that's like what I, I like the Pops character too. It's very, yeah, oh, he's he's great. He's just like, I want the best for all my hippie character. friends. Yeah. What's that? What's you that said, Drew? Drew? I said Pop to me was the most actually likable character in the movie. Yes. I'm with you. Yeah. Well, and Pop, just for the for the listener, if you have if you haven't seen it and you want to listen to this before you watch it, so Pop is this middle aged dude who lives in Topanga Canyon, where where all of our all of our characters are are hanging out, and he runs a you know kind of a head shop, curio well, shop, he makes jewelry. bookstore, jewelry. Yeah, I mean, you know, and he charges a pretty penny for all of his pieces, but you know. He just runs this shop that is frequented by everyone. And you kind of get the impression, you know, what a great life this guy's had. Like, you know, like we, we don't know what he is, but in my mind, he probably had a pretty straight life, like as a teacher or something. And he's retired and he's running the shop and probably having the best time of his life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's kind of, he's got kind of hippie duds, but he's kind of the caretaker. I mean, the reason he's pops is because everybody kind of defers to him and looks at like they're helping him when he's at the, his little, like he's got like a stand. As yes, well. yeah. and uh, you know everybody's helping him, and he cares for all of these people. Like yeah. he knows them, and he, you get the kind of you get the idea that he's kind of the rock of the hip yeah, community of this community. It's and I think that's cool, and it, also him being such a uh, recognizable character actor from the time. Yes, like if you if you watched a bunch of movies and and kind of where he, he's recognizable, and that was kind of oh look, you know, yeah, it's that guy. Yeah, he's there. yeah. When Barbado finds the vampire, and and Drew's exactly right, Uh, Barbado, in a sense, you can think of him as a lighthouse for this coffin to come towards, but regardless, Barbado is playing his flute, and it brings, you know, um, the coffin into the beach where he is, and he carries Corda off, you know, Corda's in the coffin, he carries Corda off, I guess, into the woods, and then Corda, almost that very night, makes his appearance in this uh, hippie commune and he puts him in the the truck and like drives him to the to the oh that's right yeah he's he's well prepared he's ready to that's right that's right he has he has the truck uh these hippies suddenly he appears suddenly among the hippies and i don't feel like they actually were um put off by the fact that suddenly there's another person no it's really wild always welcoming people 
it's actually very well done in the movie because I was watching this movie, you know, and I thought I was paying attention. And then, you know, and the hippies are doing their groovy thing and they're talking. And then all of a sudden, Gorda is just sitting among them and says something that makes all of their ears perk up. And I was like, when did he get there? I mean, this is very well done. You know, it, well, and then he just is, and then when he walks away, he vanishes. He like disappears like a ghost. Which yes. Is super weird. <laughs> Oh. And then I, it was so disappointing because he walks off and disappears and then Barbado walks after him and then just keeps walking down the hall. And I'm like, oh, man, I was really hoping Barbado would disappear, yes. too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that, that, is, that is the scene, by the way, where the, you know, Corda shows up and he says, I, I don't even remember because it's impossible to Drew's point. It's very stream of consciousness. I don't remember the clever things that Corda has to say other than, you know, there are ways that we can we can live better. And he, he he tries to get them to take on an organic diet and no more alcohol. And, well, you know, living, I will say have, like a living diet, which is not necessarily right. <laughs> it's if more I ever more meet, human. sorry, Julia, if I yeah. ever meet any more cordis and I've met similar people at a party, mm -hmm. I my I just want to leave or <laughs> I want to get a, as far away from those cats as possible every time. It's like, oh, you know, the thing that I think is is kind of cool about the whole thing about the the diet is that you know I'm you know as a former butcher it makes me think about like you know types of beef where like the the um cow was fed yes. partic a particular diet to get a certain kind of flavor right. and that's sort of what. Yeah, the the, the the this this oh, vampire yeah, guru point. is doing now is like he wants, wants them to let have... it taste good. Yeah, <laughs> and, and by the way, I don't That's mean awesome. specifically the diet part. I mean just his whole mannerism. It's yes. like somebody I don't want to be around. Ever. No, but it's yeah. a good point that Drew makes that he's just trying to no, make I, the people exactly. taste better. But that's, the, better. His, that, that, that's cool that's interesting what i mean is just his his whole demeanor and character are i as i was watching this movie like i want to i've I met a couple of cats like similar and i want to just not be around them <laughs> well there is one there is one of the characters the biker character mike who's fallen in with the the hippies but is a biker he from jump has no time for Korda. Uh, he, he's yeah, like, this guy's full of shit. I, I, I'm not interested in his, <laughs> I love his it. weird preaching, you know, because what happens next before Mike finally just splits, Mike comes by and Korda has taken all the hippie. He's basically said, this is my mansion now. And also it's time for a montage. All of you people need to be cheerily painting and, and washing the windows and stuff like that. And they're all doing it. So he is, this is the moment when we really get to see Korda as a, as a cult leader and not even necessarily yeah. a dangerous one yet. Just a cult leader. They're all like, yeah, all, Korda all said, cult, wash the all windows. All cult leaders start out not dangerous. They always right. start out right. dangerous. That's well, why they get everybody. I mean, well they are actually, but. <laughs> right. No, but I mean, I mean, appearance yeah, no, wise, like yeah. they seem it to is... be like, you know, you step in and they're like, you're going to be the best version of yourself. And you're like, yeah. Yes. The, uh, yeah. It, but it, he, he splits when his girlfriend burns him, right? Like that was the. Well, he finally gets sick of it's it's in one of the it's the evening later and they're all eating their their boiled vegetables or whatever it is that they they eat and they're singing their songs and his girlfriend is just hanging out and he goes I am sick of this I'm sick of your stupid food and Drew Drew what 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 is it that he says I want to go into town for some steak and some whiskey <laughs> and <laughs> see I love the idea that that, that there is this character that sees yes. through the the party yeah. line here just with this yeah. sort of zen cynicism yeah you know that speaks to me very much as a human being, which I, 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 so I would have loved if this guy had been our, our point of view. Oh, you're so right. You know? You're so right. Like, yeah. It was, oh my but gosh. I, I mean, I get why you're not going to do that in a 1970s movie. You know, you're going to want to uh, try to, you know, make your, your main character, you know the hero that we get is very much like a a, a zeitgeist kind yes. of character he does martial arts he's got long hair you know like right. he, he is very much a protagonist of the time he's very influenced by billy jack 
Oh, which yeah. is, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like 1971 was Billy Jacket. So right before this, right? Like just that moment, you get the impression they're like, what do we do with this character? I was like, well, what if we just make it Billy Jack? Like he does Kung Fu. He's got Indian stuff, you know? And yeah. Oh my God. A pure exploitation, by the way. But sure. yes, you know, I mean, like, this is what people are going to dig. That's, I mean, and I have no problem with that, right? Like, right. We watch enough, we watch enough B and down to well, B or like, Z films. <laughs> like, what, that's what if? What if they had just continued? Because, like, you know, the biker guy they kill him off very quickly, but like, it, which it's it does. Like, if you're, you, you know, Tony already kind of hit on this. Like, if you watch the opening part of the movie, it does sort of feel like that this character is going to be a more important character. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, you know, even if they had just like kept the two of them as like a vampire hunting duo that are kind of opposites in some way like you know like and yeah i understand i am reviewing the movie that i would have rather watched instead of the movie that i did watch and i you know i can't help that you know to a degree like you know like i i i do have a tendency when i'm i'm watching movies in film critic mode which is different than when i'm just watching a movie is is entertainment yeah um you know i i do tend to do a little mental rewrite rewriting to go okay well this this would have been more interesting to me but you know it could have used some some re reorganizing and i think it's one of the dangers of it as a horror movie is that they've got to kill people they do kill mike way too soon you know it doesn't serve any purpose to have him die he should stick around because the curious thing is who's taking up the space of the scenes once uh pico decides i'm splitting and i'm bringing help now you have to introduce new cops and new like like you, you got to do all this stuff to refill the frame when you could oh. have had you could have had mike well i Go think ahead. it's to, to kind of get rid of you know in with the plot it makes sense that court is like well if he's he's gonna be the sticky yeah. you know wicked here he's gonna not it's I need to get rid of this guy because he's he's not falling for any of my crap. Yeah. So although boy, by killing him, yeah. although by killing him, he he does sort of you know there there is then also the question: Hey, where did Mike go? Like, right. why did Mike never come back from town? Yeah. You know. Yeah, like, but but in the in the era, they're already being of, vamped by that point. Right. Yeah, yeah, in the right. era, a missing hippie or a missing biker, either way, not a big deal to the cops to the heat well i mean yeah, more to yeah. more to to pico yeah, but they don't care no, they're not going to care about him heat. because he was never really part of them anyway he just came well he does there. at one point he does finally ask the question you know hey where is where is mike and he goes yeah. and you know like that's one of the things he gets the cops and i'm i'm not saying that the cops would necessarily care about this like transient guy but you know within you know the way our protagonist reacts to it 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 you know it, well, it and he just gets it, found it by chance question mark it. Yep. yeah i want to i want to uh, skip to the curious thing where um uh pico i i can't really you, you can tell me in a second because i i don't want to answer this question just yet pico decides he needs to go and bring the police to investigate corda but when they come back, um, when the police show up the first time to face Corda, and this is very similar to a scene in, in Count Yorga, um, Corda has all of the hippies doing interpretive dance. <laughs> it is, it is, I, oh my God, thank God that this scene exists. That was I mean, such like, a fun scene. There are I so really many things. That. Yes. Oh, it's so great. All of these, all of these actors are just sort of spinning their faces in sort of like a sp- sort of a blissed out thing while they do their pirouettes and whatever it is so weird and great uh, and and it's you know, more like dancey yoga right fabulous you know and 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 it also sir it's i mean you can see like if will ferrell were playing we're playing corda how this could be an absolutely <laughs> hilarious film <laughs> That would be great. I'm but, definitely well, gonna see a re- I want a remake with Will Ferrell as, as, as the guru. It's, it's pretty funny already, even. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. You know, if I'm a so think back. If I'm a 22 year old, you know, in the audience at a drive-in, am I supposed to think this is goofy or disturbing? I, I, I'm I never quite sure what you're supposed I, to think. You know, I. I 
I don't think this is again another one of those things. I don't think that the um people who made this thought of it as uh, you know un, you know intentionally funny like i i think that they were trying to just make an exploitation movie and they're like oh what are what are things that hippies do oh well they do weird dances and yeah. you know they eat weird food and you know like that kind of thing and they say blissed out stuff yeah 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 so i don't really think that they were thinking that deeply about it you know i think they thought well whatever people think about this whenever they've seen it well we got their money by then so who cares right the uh yeah and my my dad has commented actually that they half the time weren't really pay- i think i think producers were aware that the audience is really only half paying attention anyway so it, it's 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 just the nature of the of the drive we are paying way more attention to these movies than the regular friday night crowd would be paying attention to them um okay so interpretive dancing what happens next is the uh, until we get to the so i don't want to like spend too much time on the plot of because what happens next is a lot of moving back and forth through the tunnels chasing one another this movie becomes very repetitive for like half an hour of the characters uh just sort of locked in a sort of cat and mouse game where pico and and pop are trying to discover you know the secrets of of count of count court i say count i'm sorry of corda and they're moving through this really amazing set that if anybody listening to this can identify this for real for us let us know because I don't know if these tunnels are uh, like winery tunnels or, or I don't know what these are. But, you know, they're separated out by these anti-flooding uh, doors. Yeah, wine and... cellar, you mean. But yeah. 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 No, I know. It's really, it was really interesting where they have the, the, these like submarine type doors. Or it's very door. wild. Clearly not built for this movie. I mean, they're just, it's a practical set of some kind. So I, I just... I would love to know: Are they really underneath this castle that they're Las Feliz Castle that they're that they're filming in, or is it somewhere else in you know around Topanga Canyon? I just want to know. Uh, anyway, eventually um, you get to an ending that is again very, very much like uh, the Count Yorga films, where um, I, I, where you, you have you have you know the death of yorga um uh, I, this is disappointing so so pico thinks that he's going to stab corda and very depressingly he instead accidentally stabs pop i don't understand exactly how this ha- i mean he literally yeah, i don't know why pop was in the coffin that pop, was weird. uh pico stabs a stake into a wooden coffin without opening it and i've seen that before and maybe that's fine but it turns out that pop had been put in the coffin but Pop must have been already pretty much dead because why would Pop be just laying in a coffin? It doesn't, that doesn't necessarily, you know, whatever. Uh, but well, he wasn't dead because he does, because yell, he does yell scream. Out. So who knows? Anyway, that's very sad because we love that character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but after that, Corda attacks Pico and we have our final fight Whoa. and then Corda dies. Yeah, go ahead. I thought, am I remembering correctly? He does, doesn't he? He confronts Corda and that was the, the deal. Well, that's. No, no, no. So he comes in. But, he's he's he 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 stabs the coffin, and then he opens the coffin, and he realizes he stabbed Pop. No, no, no. That, so and Pop, the quarter comes out. Oh, how did what? Pop? How did Pop get in? Yeah, yeah. That, I have no memory. Deal was there maybe was they cut that, where... Maybe they cut that from what the version we watched. I don't no, because we watched the same one that Tony did. But I don't remember yeah. Pop facing I off thought... alone. But maybe he did. Yeah, I. Th- th- you know. But then that... so then the then yeah. the Guru vampire is like. Um, ha ha, got you. That was funny. I, you, I, you stabbed that guy, and you thought it was me. And then, then they have this dumbest fight. And then, uh, <laughs> Pico jumps out of the way, or like rolls out of the way, and the vampire impales himself on a piece of wood. Yeah, that was kind of it is deeply it super dumb. disappointing. There's a million things yeah, they could have done with no money. I don't know why they chose to do this. I mean, they they set up this whole kind of kung fu like i said it's clo- it seemed closer to jujitsu or something with more throws mm-hmm. when he's because he's he's grappling and when yeah. we show him doing his martial arts he's grappling a lot right good point yeah and there's a whole he's set up a whole thing like he could have grappled and thrown him or something that yeah. was a whole that's part of his character and yet he just kind of goes oh and then <laughs> i've fallen out the way and then uh 
you know, Corda impales himself, yeah. which is, I mean, I guess it kind of goes into the, what we kind of get is this nihilistic thing. Like, you know, you couldn't do anything really. It's, it's chance in this world, but still give Pico something. I mean, he's been, he's been through the ringer. Give him, give him, give him a chance to, to do something good, but nope. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I can't, I, I, maybe it's a budget thing. Where literally they didn't have time to Corey. I I don't know. I, but you don't I even make... have to. I mean, it's not like come on. It's not like that fight at the beginning was super choreographed. No, that's true. Just ran at each other and he grappled him and you know yeah hit him. So I him cannot. Him like, I have no yeah, excuse. I can't explain on. it at, at all. But 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 um. Uh, but what's interesting is the end after that, which is that once Corda is dead um all of the people that he's turned into vampires and i've never seen this in a movie before they all just poof they turn into well it's the know. whole idea like instead so instead of, it's an interesting twist because again there there's a lot of like good bits so pop in addition to being this thing he's also knows all this occult stuff like he's yes. got this, these books so he's the reference so when they're starting to do investigation and pico's like look this is what i saw and yeah. and pop finally believes him he's like oh well according to this manuscript uh the disciples wear these necklaces because so they can go out and so they can be day walkers that's kind of cool and like pop yeah. says this kind of that's a very knowledge good point. as being you know the giles of the of the movie kind of neat he's, um, the, he's a regular hippie van helsing yeah well There's he's a... not he's a, but he's not really he's just no he's like i said he's more no but it's true he's, he's he can find that rune and everything and by and, the way so yeah, go well ahead. but uh you know that all of that stuff is is fascinating like uh you know the bit so usually we'll get a thing and that's one thing that's also this it kind of has the horror short story nihilism that you kind of see in a lot of like where you get from like horror short story book like book fair horror anthologies where bad like it's just bad at the end just mean and bad i remember i had a couple of those and so instead of kind of turning back into their normal selves instead they're they're just they're too far gone that's it yeah. and that's whoa <laughs> that was that was surprising Super i will dark, say yeah. no you're right it, it, it is kind of like the buffy the vampire slayer concept where once you're a vampire you know the soul is gone the body is a is a corrupted thing and so they will poof, when you die into dust, into dust. Yeah. also their hope even when when they're talking about it beforehand their hope is they can catch everyone before they're too far gone and yeah. we get the impression that that may not have ever been a, a possibility maybe we don't know yeah because even his girlfriend yeah didn't seem to be as far gone still turns to dust just that's just and that's slower. like oh that was you yeah, know we end with him like yelling like a you know kind of ash at the end <laughs> like oh like, well, it was it was really dark really dark ending. yeah she you know she looks she looks okay because she was part of the and then begins to decay which was kind of a cool effect again that's you know it was, it was well, put, your, you put know, your money on that that was kind of neat and that's sort of what puts this movie squarely into the the 70s as opposed to like the 60s because mm -hmm. Like in the seventies, we did start to get more into cynical, you know, endings, and you know, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where you, even though the heroine survives, she seems like she's lost her yes. damn mind. Or you know, John Carpenter, of course, always likes to end his movies kind of ambiguously, and th this feels very much like that and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know i i i think if, even though we're dealing with hippies and this sort of um love generation you know that kind of whole thing like you know if this had been a 60s movie i think it probably would have been a little bit more optimistic mm. in the way it ended but like this the, you know the fact that it, it does kind of get you know like punch punch you in the gut in the last few seconds you know that's that to me is more of a 70s kind of thing <laughs> yeah i i just wanted to mention there's this scene when uh some of the some of the vampires are coming to town to do basically errands, right? And to pick up stuff. This is just after after uh, Pop has figured out, you know, showing them the rune for them to be able to walk around. And as they're walking, uh, you know, and we see them in town, Pico calls to them, they don't respond. But this is the part that is very, a part anyway, that is very, very like Manson. You know, the whole concept of, 
of the Manson family well, girls going into town and getting fruit and whatever the hell they they needed to pick up. You know, it, it's it, and if you're watching it, I think in '72, that's going to pop into your head a lot because you've been watching all of those trials and stuff. Go not ahead. to be that guy, but the, that's Flip. He says, "Hey, they didn't talk to me in anything. Like, what what was this symbol? I noticed mm. they had the symbol. Oh, you're right. So yeah, the, that's right. The exactly. Detective work comes after that, where they're like, like, I saw him in town. Nobody's talking to me. All my friends, you know. No, you're exactly right. You're right. In the castle, pops. What's up? He's like, well, there's this entry. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of it's a little pat." As far as like, oh, well, here's some other stuff I found. Uh, but I think it's part of him being this touchstone and this, you know, cultural librarian of the group, you know. Yeah. Keeping the, you know, get the impression he's been keeping them out of trouble where he can for a while. Yeah. The fact that it also leads to his occult knowledge is kind of fascinating, it's, actually. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, there's so, there's so many like what is the status of this movie is this movie in the public domain like what is like what's the deal with it you know i don't think it's in the public domain because if it were i think that we would see a bazillion burned badly burned copies of it on dvd at like heb down the street (laughs) that's a good point yeah i mean lots or whatever but there is a uh, let's see when that recent dvd came out there's a there's a DVD from Fred Olin Ray's company. Uh, it's not doesn't say it's discontinued, but it's 21 years old. The last DVD. So mm-hmm. so you know I mean um, and here's one that it, where it's bundled in with something else, and that's from 2008. This thing has not been printed in a long time. So obviously that's a rights issue. So it's not in the public domain. It's just you know God only knows who has the rights to this, which is weird. Um, hmm. Well anyway. That if takes court, us... court is trying to keep the history down. That's right. He doesn't want you to know. Right. It's the he, he so wants to, he wants to keep us away from the untold history of I, I want to see more Yorga identities. If if Yorga is able to just reinvent himself over and over again for different groups, there are other things that he could be doing. You know, he could be in amongst a bunch of Nazis. He could be in amongst a bunch of like like Black Panthers. I mean, he could be he could be anywhere. Um, the cab driver. <laughs> I I mean he would look different too. Good. Yeah. All right. Uh let's get our final thoughts. And uh um well before I do that, is there I, I know I skipped over really the second half because I think it becomes kind of kind of a munge, but we hit on a lot of it. Is there anything else that you'd like to call out before we move on to final thoughts? All um, right. Well, if anything comes if anything comes up. You can bring it up. Uh, so, Julia, what are your final thoughts on on uh, Corda, the Death Master? So, you know, according to like Roger Ebert and other people, it's like, um, oh, this movie was just them trying to, you know, have a tax write off and, and and use up the contracts that on these people that they had or whatever. So, but I don't know. I mean, even despite that, and, and despite the fact that it was made in like seventeen days, um, I think it has a lot going for it. I think it's actually entertaining, and it's there's some really mm-hmm. cool stuff. Like I say, I like this the music and the score and the and the and the weird choices that they make for um the soundtrack and uh i love the clothing i love the the set so it's not a terrible movie i mean it's really we've definitely <laughs> watched worse ones yes. um but you know yeah it's I, I think more than anything i think the part that disappointed me the most was just how the vampire gets beat you know gets defeated but yeah. um other than that, you know, I think it's fine. It's just, you know, there's some silly parts and whatever, but it's not, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was entertaining. Excellent. Uh, who do we, Tony, what about you? Yeah, I think it's a solid, you know, B movie. I guess I, I still feel like it kind of fits in that TV movie vibe, but I like that aesthetic as well in some ways i definitely don't mean that say more a, about that like what makes what uh, i think like the score movies? and oh, just no. the pacing and how it's kind of cut the way I don't know, there's multiple just things in the in the presentation and the uh the way it's put together um and the the flavor of the um you know how it's filmed as well in some way and again yeah. i don't i really don't mean that as a bad thing no but no it just has a vibe and it's a vibe <laughs> i enjoy so it's just interesting that well visually it's interesting it's interesting in that there is a certain way you you film a movie and how it's portrayed that gives it that feeling um and i find it fascinating when i find a movie that kind of feels that way but wasn't you know 
Yeah, I the um I, I'm trying to think of what th there are lots of things that would make it have that particular effect, but one of them is just to me the background. I mean, when you think about it, Tony, mm -hmm. the way this movie looks, um, especially in those hills, in that particular yeah. sun, you know, those particular trees, it looks, you know, that there were there was a and how we even even the introductions, like how we are introduced, like the cuts from the bikers to the hippies. Yes. So all of yes. that just has the end. The, like I said, the way that the pacing is done, act to act, and yeah. scene to scene, it could easily be you a know, TV. It goes movie. into You're the montage. Right. It goes yeah. like it just has that flow, which yeah. I think is interesting when you find that out. But I think there's, I mean, the nihilism on display by the end, yes. and you know, this idea of vampire as cult leader is is really interesting. Um, I I think it's you know kind of fast. It's fascinating that it's so far out of print the only way to catch it is youtube it's i mean i think this would do kind of well on shutter just as a it's a really good point but like i i mean there's there's obvious reasons why it's not there right probably like you said rights issues it's yeah. you know i would guess that again it's music rights issues which tend to gum mm -hmm. up the works and i'm all about musicians getting paid right <laughs> like sure. don't get me wrong i'm like oh why are they why are they greedy or whatever but if i had to guess when you see credits that say these themes by these people, yeah, it's more likely. Well, especially it's since it's Ray Conniff, so it's a major right, player. Exactly, exactly, you know? and that's where that's when I see those things. Hmm. I tend to say, you know, the clearance is just not worth it for the people who would want to. I want to put out this DVD. Well, we got to clear the music rights this way. Um, I, you know, again, I'm fully invested in musicians getting their worth right, but sometimes, you know, for better or worse, that can get in the way of uh how much people want to invest in a especially something that's a b movie that you know what's what's the actual interest how many copies are you going to move which it sucks that we have to think of commercial art that oh, way but that's just the way it is let me ask a practical question um mm -hmm. before we before we move on to drew if i've if i have a movie like this you know mm -hmm. i'm a i'm a just dvd distributor or a video on demand distributor and i acquire a movie like this but i got to clear these music rights mm -hmm. how much work is it for me instead to go just cut the music replace it with library music well i mean they did that for what wkrp for a while yeah i'm sure they did i i don't i don't remember but i'm sure that's the case i mean it's know? it's not i mean again how much how much investment do you want to well also, you have to balance that too, right? Like for because yeah. for years people were like, also, I hate these DVDs or I hate this release because it doesn't have the original music. Yeah. So if you were going to present a movie like where there's X amount of cult, well, it has a cult following, right? Yeah. Is a cut release where you cut the songs going to be reviled and therefore you're stuck with thousands of copies to sit in a warehouse because people got wind that you made changes? Yeah. It, and those are the things you have to you have to think about as a tribute as a distributor yeah. so you might go look we just couldn't get the rights um they did you know that happened with um one of the gundam mm. there was a neil sadaka like intro. really huh like he did the intro but it was only like you know it was licensed in japan so when it came to i think it was neil Sadaka, i'm pretty sure um but when it came to outside of japan uh they need to get the clearance yeah and they just didn't feel like it was worth it and it was during the uh intro so they made a different one and people, you know, I wanted to see the original intro. I mean, luckily we live in a world where there's YouTube, so somebody's uploaded it, right? Yes. But those are the kinds of choices. But where you have things that are in the film and you want to replace it, it gets a little dicier because then you got to, you know, in a better world, you would match lips and all of that, right? So you got to come up with a better way. You don't want to cut the film, especially if people are like, I want a Death Master. It, it, right. it depends on how, how you know, you have to balance that. Like, am I going to well, give I'm, I'm just wondering what they want or not? You brought up what the, the risks are, but I'm just wondering, like, is it, it seems like just practically you also have to hire not cheap engineers to go in and sure. mess with the sound to begin with, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, exactly. And, and the, like, and that's that's a far cry from I just bought this movie and I'm just going to digitize it and put it out. Now all of right. a sudden I've got to spend easily thousands and thousands of dollars, you know. And, and yeah, so that yeah, I, and I get it. You'll see it happen. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, look at look at all the video releases of uh, Return of the Living Dead. Yeah, we only just 
recently in the past few years outside of VHS. We just recently got a digital, a Blu-ray, mm -hmm. where you can select a version that has original audio intact, etc. Right. Yeah. And it was determined that it was more important to have a DVD release. Uh, same with, oddly enough, The Hobbit on DVD has sound effects. Mm. The, the the music's all intact, but sound effects are missing and stuff because of the mastering or however that was. Huh. So like, you, again, as a distributor, you have to make those choices. And that's that's where you run into, you know, is it going to be okay enough or are the vocal minority of fans who really want this cult classic going to give it a pass? Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. That's a good point. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Drew, what are your thoughts? Coming back to the film as opposed to the distribution <laughs> of the film. <laughs> well, first off, I mean, just to dovetail on this, like, it seems to me that somebody should get the rights to the two Yorga movies in this movie and just do a, a box set. Absolutely. Like, I, you know, it's kind of crazy to me that like Screen, Screen Factory or Vinegar, Vinegar Syndrome or, or, you know, one of those hasn't done that because at the very least is something I mean, adjacent to two more slightly more popular movies. Yeah. You know, this would be worth an inclusion in that. Well, but there's a Yorga, there's a, there's a dual disc Yorga set. Yeah. But does I it have, think I was, it doesn't, it doesn't have I think it, no. I, 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 Thought I saw somebody talking about the commentary where it talked about this movie. I I have a vague I have a memory of that as well. And um, I think that you will get information if you get that Yorga set. Um, oh, they made a really nice limited edition too. Oh, uh, like if you I get said, the Yorga I, set, I think that I think that they that there's discussion about it if I remember correctly. But it's been a bit since I looked at that set. Here I'm sitting, 2023, would plunk down good money yeah. for uh, for a, a box set with well, the, those three movies. Arrow, so, Arrow, evident, Arrow's the last uh, distributor to put that out. So it would have to be an Arrow's court. To would, would, if for court. whatever reason, one of those, you know, the, the, the execs from Arrow is listening to this podcast. <laughs> you know, you have at least one customer. Yeah, here. for sure. Uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, um, the movie itself, you know, it's not perfect. It's, it's not an amazing film, but it's fun. And, you know, I, I watch for what it's worth. Like I watched this on a day where I had a migraine and I was laid up in bed and I watched horror movies pretty much the whole day. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, this was one of the ones that, that stuck with me after, you know, I, I went back to, to business as usual. And I, th I thought it was a good, cause I thought it was a good time, you know, mm -hmm. like, and sometimes that's all you, you, you need um you know so uh you know it, yes i kind of poked a lot of holes in it but like that's that's the job when you're analyzing a movie to a degree absolutely and it um, certainly doesn't keep you from watching it again that's for sure no i yeah. would and which i totally would like yeah. if, if somebody were to say like hey you know want to throw a vampire movie on and and i were to say okay let's Let's do Death Master. I would, I would eagerly watch because I think this would be the sort of movie that would be a good time. Like if you had like a, a room full of people and some pizza, and <laughs> you know, like it, it, it would be a good horror movie party movie. Um, and anybody who watches a lot of horror movies, like they know exactly what I'm talking about. So, um, yeah, you know. Th this is that and you know i don't think it's quite as much fun as yorga but you know it is still a good time you know if i were to do the my typical movie party idea i think i would do this uh race with the devil and devil's reign oh yeah yeah that's a good like triple feature. like the trill the the through line of the kind of nihilism and culty stuff i think you yeah can add a york movie but i think that that would be the trilogy that i would show just for some just different textures right race I, with I the devil is a really i mean you could also uh i think do like you could do horror movies that take place like around topanga canyon i mm -hmm. mean there, there's a there, there's a lot of stuff that would capture like you know you could do like the girl in the empty grave which is admittedly is more of a mystery than a horror but there's there's we could probably pull together oh 
That one with Linda Blair, where she rides horses and there's the devil, the 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 witch um, who has infiltrated her family. Summer of Fear, which is a Wes Craven movie. That also is shot in Topanga Canyon. So it and so we need one more to make a nice triple feature. But there's mm. there's probably some. Well, great and what's the one that um, what's the one that um, that is also shot there? Was the creature? Uh, let's see. I'm looking at the trivia to see because it was in the IMDb. Trivia oh uh, that... well, uh, Ebert thought that they had filmed Crab Monsters. Yeah, could that uh, one? But he was talking about the Santa Monica Beach, um, where, where Attack of are. the Crab Monsters. What makes you think it's not that? It may very well be. Uh, but that's in that's at the beach. I'm just talking about this this inland filming you know inside the you know in the canyon oh. although it's next to the beach so yeah sure um but excellent point uh all right that's that's probably enough discussion of death master but boy i'm so happy that we watched that thank you very much for indulging me on that one well, as we make our way through a bunch of vampire movies that are more or less unconnected from one another which is super exciting uh let's get our our um endorsements like what have you been listening to that you want or watching or reading that you want to share um starting with julia do you have anything for us sure um we went to see uh operation fortune ruse de guerre in the, in the at the amc theater and it is a guy ritchie film with um jason statham and hugh grant and Aubrey plaza and carrie elwes it's really fun I, I really enjoyed it i thought it was a lot of fun um just as a kind of um I don't know what what would you say the genre is, Jason. Well, it's a Guy Ritchie film. I mean, it's basically it's it, it's, Guy but it's genre. not like a Guy Ritchie crime film. It's more like a like a Guy Ritchie British Mission Impossible movie. Yeah, and um, it's so it's it was good. amusing. Yeah. It was it was a fun fun watch. And then I watched a movie on Netflix called We Have a Ghost um, with mm. Anthony Mackie, oh, yeah. David Harbour, and that was a really fun movie. I that was just a, that was more of a a, a, of a cute like i was know, surprised almost like a family film it was really yeah. really cute yeah, yeah i enjoyed it um i thought david harbour was great as a silent ghost <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was a fun 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 film so if you're looking you know if you're just on netflix it's it's definitely worth just having having on um but yeah but i spent the last uh, few weeks obsessed with the alex murdoch trial so now i don't know what i'm gonna <laughs> be playing in the background of my life we'll see we'll see what next week brings excellent uh, Tony, what about you? I've been watching a bunch of stuff because we took kind of a break. Um, I have been really enjoying this season of the uh, Wu-Tang Clan uh, series, um, which is just excellent series. Um, if you like uh, biopic, you know, music biopic series, it's great. Uh, Poker Face continues to be amazing. Um, I'm yes. really uh, stoked about that. The one <laughs> I recommend that's kind of I might, this is a recommendation that I really enjoy. Fantastic Fest favorite. Um, I got a screener and it's out on uh, VOD now. And I need to post all the links on our socials. So Jason, I need to get all these up. But uh, okay. FP4, FP4 Eds. The FP is a <laughs> crass, really fun, in my opinion. This is a movie, I like the absurdity of it. This may not be for everyone. And I hate the the filmmakers i hope don't don't mind me saying that the film is not for everyone but if you love absurdity it's a post-apocalyptic world where a version of dance dance revolution is how people settle their differences mm. extremely profane by the way and filmed at brazier park uh and it's i it has and they have this like kind of new apocalyptic um kind of also got kind of a white trash lingo that goes throughout it but this is the fourth one in the series <laughs> fp4 evs and they filmed it a lot on green screens it's like it's interesting that they've made it more and more digital uh both for filmmaking purposes and budgetary you know purposes but uh i did get a screener link from xyz and it's i needed to put it up uh but i want to make sure it was an endorsement if you like the previous fp films uh in my opinion you're getting more of this kind of just crazy vision <laughs> And you're kind of long for the ride or not, you know? Uh, but I had a lot of fun. The filmmakers are really cool. I've met them several times at Fantastic Fest. And I think if you're down for just insane uh, pastiche of video games and just bizarre stuff, uh, FP4 Fs has you covered. I really enjoy it. But I don't know if everyone... 
I think even diehard fans, I, I don't know, you take these at, at your own, but I recommend it and I have had a blast um, with these films. I'm also playing the new Yakuza game, which takes place in feudal Japan, but has, in the same way that they also did a Fist of the North Star Yakuza game, they have, this is a remake of a, of one, but it's an updated version. Oh, and speaking of Fist of the North Star, there's also Fist of the North Star Jason, you might be fascinated yeah. by this. Fist of the North Star Fitness Boxing, hmm. where you it's the switch. So you have, you know, you hold wow, the controllers really? in your hand, you, you box. Oh, man, that's <laughs> But you're cool. punching, fist, you know, it's post-apocalyptic boxing, which, by the way, I you know, all these things are very that sounds great, laser-focused to Tony, I think. I mean, obviously other people, but if you have a switch and you, you know, if you, and it teaches you like the stance, boxing stance, and, you know, of course you can cheat it and just shake it. I believe that our 21 year old daughter has the switch at college. So I, I bought little hand, you know, (laughs) things to keep in your hands to see and, you know, make sure you're holding the punching, but I have been enjoying, I've also been getting more active, trying to uh, get back in shape to try to play out more and uh i you know fist of the north star boxing is what's kind of got me back into like in the in the d- days of not having a Wii. um i don't know punching punching apart uh mad max style enemies that sounds <laughs> where's that, that for fantastic. me <laughs> so that's my endorsements i know that they're all over the map but i mean anybody if you've listened this far you understand that that's just yeah me. that's me uh awesome thank you very much drew what about you um two two things one of them being more of a personal nature um i did check out um spine of night the other day on shutter which has been out for a while but i just now got around to watching it but it is uh kind of a throwback to like heavily rotoscoped um early 80s sort of ralph bashy Mm-hmm. Frank Fazetta influenced huh. uh, fantasy animated fantasy movies. So it is gleefully retro. So like your mileage may vary on that, but I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so, you know, I, I do highly recommend it if you are a fan of stuff like, you know, fire and ice or wizards, you know, like I think that this would, would be, you know, a movie that you would enjoy um aside from that um i am looking f- it is ringo awards nomination time and it uh at this point uh fans can still nominate their favorites and i am looking for support because i am trying to muster up support not only for me to get nominated as best writer but also uh halloween man as both best hero and best web comic so uh if you enjoy my comic or just enjoy me on this podcast please consider going to the ringo award awards uh website and just taking a few seconds to fill out the form and uh you know nominating me i would greatly appreciate it fabulous thank you thank you very much um i will just endorse julia's endorsements so uh i i really enjoyed the new guy Ritchie movie but um uh ruse de guerre so what is what is it it's called orson fortune ruse de guerre which is a crazy a crazy title, but it's very good, and it's got a killer cast of no, you know. The character's name is Orson. Sorry, the character's name is Orson, but it's Operation Fortune. It's Operation the... Fortune Ruse de Guerre. Yeah. How could I forget that? I'm so sorry. Anyways, it's a Jason, long name. Jason Statham. Uh, it's got uh, Aubrey Plaza, Hugh Grant. It's a it's a really good Guy Ritchie film. Anyway, all right, that brings us to the end. We are rocketing through some standalone cool vampire movies uh our good friends at the monster movie happy hour are probably going to be joining us for a vampire movie to be announced very soon which we're extremely excited about uh and and then we'll be moving towards our 400th episode and uh that's going to be fun that's going to be just within the next the next five episodes which depending on whether we take any weeks off will be happening in the next like six weeks or so so there we go uh everyone be excellent to one another thank you very very much come to the facebook page and give us your theories on whether these are in fact the same vampire corda and uh yorga and we will talk to you all soon bye everybody bye Bye. good night